This podcast episode on Hamas's October 7, 2023 attack on Israel is unique for the table. We rarely cover current events as they unfold, much less events with such personal and global significance. At times, guests display the emotion that comes from knowing victims of the attacks. We decided not to edit out these moments. Our guests long for God's protection of the innocent and justice against the wicked. There's biblical precedence for this request and the emotion that accompanies it. One need look no further than Psalm 9. We also want to remember that there is legitimate concern for those Palestinians who are also among Hamas's victims. We hope to follow up with a podcast episode exploring this topic. One thing is clear. Hamas helps no one, Palestinian or Jew. We offer this discussion of the conflict with these reflections in mind. Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And our topic today is, uh, is the current situation in Israel uh, at, in the aftermath of uh, the, the battle really between Israel and Hamas. And so uh, I have two uh, ministry experts who have had ministry experience uh, with their organizations in Israel for a long time, David Brickner of Jews for Jesus, who's in uh, the San Francisco area, and Mitch Glazer uh, of Chosen People Ministries is in the New York City area. So I think we can say we've kind of got the country covered between the three of us, because I'm sitting here in Dallas, and uh, um, and w- I want I we're just going to dive straight in. Uh, let's talk about a little bit about the context in which we find ourselves, and uh, why uh, why this situation has emerged. Uh, uh, what's going on? And and Mitch, I'll let you lead off. Okay. Uh- there are some very gruesome details. I don't think that this is a war or a battle like a normal war or normal battle because it's not been fought between professional soldiers. It's actually uh, a battle between terrorists and civilians. Uh, the ground war hasn't started yet, and that uh, will be slightly different. But for the most part, of the 1,300 Israelis that were killed, Probably 1,100 of them uh, were civilians, and uh, they're still trying to figure out the numbers. And so this is, this is not just a war. This is a merciless attack by uh, terrorists at a massive scale uh, on Israelis. So on a week ago Saturday or whenever this podcast will get out there, on October 7th, based upon the number of bodies that were recovered of terrorists, it looks like about 1,500 terrorists, maybe more, broke through the borders of Gaza. Uh, They uh, cut through the fence. They came on gliders. They came on rafts. And they slaughtered 1,300 Israelis. More than 3,000 were wounded. And about now the number is about 200 were kidnapped. That includes babies, moms, dads, elderly people, uh, everybody. And as a result of these stunning, horrific and gruesome uh, issues that came up because, you know, nobody could could really figure it out as it was happening. It took a few days, really, to just basically count the bodies. Uh, And, you know, I I do believe the stories um, have been pretty verified about beheading babies and and everything else. You just have to, when you're dealing with Hamas, you basically are looking at the same stream of uh, extreme uh, Islam, militant, violent Islam. And so... Uh, Now what we have is there were 360,000 IDF soldiers called up. And uh, right now, these soldiers are gathering on the border of Gaza. Some, of course, are 
taking care of the northern border with Hezbollah. And they're going to go in, and their goal is to deconstruct Hamas, to destroy them. And, uh, and so Israel is shell-shocked. Uh, th this is the worst catastrophe for Jewish people since the Holocaust. And so, I mean, I can't compare it to the Holocaust, but in, in one day to have that many innocents killed, and I don't know, David can probably describe some of the uh, areas of, of, of attack if he wants. But the Israeli IDF, the Israeli soldiers, are poised to go into Gaza, and their mission will be to destroy uh, Hamas. Obviously, we make a distinction between Hamas and between average Palestinian uh, citizens and people. And uh, our hearts go out to the families and the loved ones of the Israelis who were killed. And, of course, our hearts will go out and will go out to uh, the innocent Palestinians that will be killed. But I can promise you, Daryl, my heart doesn't go out one bit for Hamas, mm. I believe. I'm praying for God's judgment to rain upon them, mm. and I'm praying for them to be destroyed. Mm. That makes me a lousy Christian, and so be it. Mm. But I, wanna, I, I really hope and pray that, that there will be a divine victory through the very faulty and human IDF, and that uh, this curse on the earth of Hamas will be wiped out. Yeah, so. and yeah. By the time this is released, I mean some of this may have happened. I mean it's conceivable that uh, the troops will have rolled in, and we'll be hearing about uh, what's taken place as a result. David, you want to add anything? Yeah, um, Mitch, I don't think of you as a bad Christian for having those feelings about Hamas because this is not a group that's just dealing with, you know the rights of uh, the Palestinians for a homeland, they are hell-bent on the destruction of the Jewish people, wherever they might be. And they are also uh, haters of the God of the Jewish people. I think it was incredibly cynical and revealing that they chose the day of our rejoicing, a Jewish uh, biblical holiday, to attack. Uh, they are opposed to all who follow the God of Israel. And uh, so we need to recognize that God's judgment is already on them for the position that they've taken, for the lives that they have uh, taken, murdered. And this is not just um, <clears throat> Jewish people. The uh, innocents who live in Gaza are also dying because of Hamas. And so we need to recognize that these people are against life itself, and they are willing to take that life. And so I applaud Israel's commitment to uh, completely obliterate this uh, terrorist group. Um, and I think that uh, the posture of our United States government has, is also laudable to stand a hundred percent behind Israel. And I hope that the church does as well and does not fall prey to some of the equivocation that so often comes. And that's going to be a more tempting uh, issue when uh, the ground war begins and there will be uh, a call for ceasefire. There will be a call for, uh, you know, comparing the loss of life. Uh, any loss of life in Gaza uh, is uh, on the hands of Hamas, uh, because they're the ones that are hiding there behind the innocents. So we just need to be, um, and I think this has happened, that there's a, a renewed moral clarity in our nation, even in places that you wouldn't expect it, uh, as we are hearing government officials and uh, legacy media uh, talking heads talk about pure evil. Well, that's that. That's a judgment call that has not been heard very often from uh, the podium in the White House or the floor of the Senate or uh, from the New York Times. But they are uh, stating that, and so, if in one sense this evil has 
made itself manifest beyond those who should recognize it. But for us who are believers in Jesus, there's no question that this is good versus evil. This is the God of Israel versus Hasatan, the adversary. It's the cosmic conflict of all the ages uh, writ large for us to see in our generation. So just quickly, just to um, fill some gaps for people, October 7th on the Jewish calendar, why was that significant? Well, it was the end of uh, the Feast of Sukkot, the, the most joyous feast in all of the uh, feasts found in Leviticus chapter 23. It was the conclusion, uh, Simchat Torah, the rejoicing in God giving the law. It's a day where the scriptures say you shall have nothing but joy. And that's what God was intending for his people Israel. And for all who are part of uh, the, the the grafted in blessed uh, uh, Gentiles who worship the God of Israel, this is a celebration of God's provision for us. And at that high point of the Jewish festival, the concluding feast of of all of the seven, uh, this evil intent came into Israel to st- to rob the the command to have nothing but joy instead giving us nothing but sorrow. So there's a spiritual dynamic we cannot forget about when we think about these global issues. This is, and you see the protests going on in major cities around the world in support of what happened, which is horrifying. And it it makes you realize this is not isolated to the Middle East. This is a sickness and a sinfulness that is in the human heart across the globe. And and those of us who love the Lord and who love his people need to recognize this is not a battle isolated in one small part of the Middle East. It's across the globe. And, and it's and a, we, it, go, ahead, go ahead, Mitch. I, I didn't well, mean to. Well, just, just, just uh, um, I agree with David's perspective, of course. But just to remind people that it was the Sabbath. It was the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, and uh, it was a holiday. It was one, And if you read Leviticus chapter 23, you'll see that it's a no-work day, you know. And, uh, and so between a Sabbath, a holiday, the 50th anniversary, this was a date that was carefully selected by Hamas. And, uh, and so it was... And again, the, the key problem with this that makes it distinct is that the attacks were not against the military. The attacks were against their neighbors who lived on Kfar Gaza, uh, I mean, uh, Kibbutz Gaza, it, I mean, it, it, or Aza, which is what it is in Hebrew. I mean, it was, it was right, right there and uh, right next door, two kilometers from uh, the fence. And uh, that was the first group that was wiped out. It was it was 260 or 70 kids who were at a uh, concert and were in part a New Age festival that went there to uh, to have fun and enjoy themselves. And now their parents uh, are waiting for some of them uh, to come home, um, but they've been abduct- abducted in Gaza. We spoke to uh, a relative in Israel and asked how they were handling it. And she said, I've gone to more funerals with friends, four friends, than I have in my entire life. Hmm. Because her kids are the same age as the kids that were slaughtered. And they were friends with so many who were killed. It's, it's, it's innumerable. And, and so, again, they picked a date when the fences would be down and... And, and they killed and slaughtered children, elderly people, babies, not soldiers. I just, just, even I sometimes use the word war, but the war is about to begin, but this was not a war. This was, this was a, a terrorist slaughter. One, one of the points that I like to make in talking about Hamas is um, Hamas is not interested in defending the Palestinian people. They are interested in, and I think David, you said this earlier. They're interested in, in, um, in, in trying to wipe Israel off the face of the earth and 
kick them out of the land, et cetera, and are interested in any means uh, to do so. And I know when I've spoken to Palestinian groups, which I have done, about the situation in Israel, it is this reality that I say um, you have to take into account why Israel is so um, committed to her own security. This is, this is an illustration of why. And uh, sometimes I think people forget that, that some, of the, some of the things that people have been complaining about, the cause of it is the presence of a group that wants to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. And the Bible is clear, and I want to talk about this biblically for a second, the Bible is clear that a country has the right to defend its people and the well-being of its people. That's one of the reasons governments exist. And so, you know, we have the idea of what's called sometimes just war theory about the way in which uh, battle should happen. And and you're pointing out about this being uh, not a fighting of of soldiers, but an attack on people. That's a a violation of of what most people see to be um, international standards about how conflict should be fought. So... um, uh, just that that's just an observation. Let me turn my attention and, and you can comment on this or what I'm going to raise next. The protests around the globe um, uh, raise a, a specter of another reality that really um, Jews have been coping with for their almost their entire existence. That's anti-Semitism and the significance of anti-Semitism. Um, and l- let's talk a little bit about uh, about that because I think this, uh, this, the the uh, cl- the moral clarity that you all were talking about earlier um, is important to appreciate here because it should be a check on what has been uh, a problem with regard to anti-Semitism that uh, runs the centuries when it comes to Israel. So I'll let you go either direction. You can talk about Hamas or you can talk about anti-Semitism, whichever way you want to go, into whoever. Well, uh, I'll just speak briefly. Anti-Semitism, uh, the source of anti-Semitism is Satan himself. He was the first one uh, to hate the Jewish people. And he has inspired that hatred. Why? Because Satan understands the role of the Jewish people based upon God's covenants, the choosing of Abraham from the Abrahamic covenant on. The devil, who can't control history, he can only interrupt it at times, but what what happened is the devil um, was trying to destroy uh, the Jewish people, was trying to keep the Messiah from being born. Just look at the history. If he could wipe out the Jewish people, he could, he could uh, wipe out the per- plan and purposes of God. And so uh, I think it's important for those listening, Daryl, to at, at least have a... a uh, I mean, I know many people who listen to the podcast, and they and many of them have a, a, a deep understanding of Scripture, and theological sophistication, and and so I know that I'm speaking to many people who understand exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, that uh, the Jewish people are not finished yet, and the the plan of God through the Jewish people will continue. Ultimately, the Jewish people will be the light to the nations that the Jewish people are supposed to supposed to be. And if you read Romans 11, chapters 25 through the end of the chapter, you see that there's a day coming when the Jewish people will turn to Jesus and Jesus will return. It's well it's well understood in certain circles, uh, especially uh, with those who take the Bible very, very literally. And we understand that the Jewish people have a role to play. The Jewish people had to role to play in the coming of the first coming of the Messiah, and the Jewish people have a role to play in the second coming of the Messiah. And it's clear that the devil is trying to interrupt and, and counter God's plan. And so we have to understand that there is a cosmic battle. You know, it's like Daniel uh, 9, 10, and 11 just coming coming to four. There, there are principalities and powers, Paul says in Ephesians 6. And these things are happening, and it plays out through humanity and in, in, in history. So am I saying that Hamas is from the devil? Uh, yeah, probably, yeah. Am I saying that every, every individual who hates Jewish people 
Well, I won't exactly call them from the devil, but I will say that it's a devilish scheme that they've embraced and that they should reject and they should repent. And so wherever it is, we had the protests in New York in Times Square. You had it in Paris. We're in the north of, of, of France. An Israeli diplomat was stabbed. Uh, I mean, you had it all over the place. But probably the penult penultimate expression of satanic anti-Semitism, which brings the moral clarity that David mentioned, occurred on October 7th. And to see that has really caused people to take sides. My prayer, and I know that I'm talking to many believers right now, my prayer is that believers will understand that when you align yourself with those who are against the Jewish people, that you've actually aligned yourself with Satan. Hmm. It's a satanic plan. I'm not calling you demon-possessed, but I am saying that it is a satanic plan. And um, last statement, there's a good Southern Baptist preacher uh, that I like very much. And, you know, the Southern Baptists have such a great way of preaching. I wish I was Southern Baptist. I'm conservative Baptist. I'm not Southern Baptist. But I wish I was. This, this Southern Baptist leader said, we need to love what God loves. And we need to hate what God hates. And my prayer is that Christians will step up and be bold and will embrace the Jewish people and will love the Jewish people because God loves the Jewish people and hate the devil and hate those who embrace devilish schemes to try and destroy the Jewish people. David? Yeah, I, uh, the greatest evil that a person can commit, according to Jewish tradition is Chilul Hashem, the the uh, the cursing, the bringing ill repute on the name of God Himself, and uh, this attack is Chilul Hashem because God staked His reputation on the perpetuity of the Jewish people, and so to attack the Jews is really to attack the reputation of the Creator of the universe, and He has promised He's jealous for His name. And for his glory, he'll not give it to another. And so any effort to undermine, to destroy, to harm the Jewish people, that's why the scriptures say it's like touching the apple of God's eye, poking God in the eye. It is uh, an, an assault on the, on the name of the one that we love and worship. And so we need to recognize what's at stake here. It's not just an attack on Jewish people. It's an attack on the God of Israel, who is the God of all who follow the Lord Jesus. So I, I really feel like the foundation of this is not just, you know, the Jewish people. It's the Jewish God, and it's the God of Israel. It's the God of Jesus, uh, his father, that is being attacked. His reputation is being called into question, and he promises in the end that he's going to preserve his people for the, his name's sake. And, and, and so when we enter into prayer, you know, Psalm 122, verse 6 says, uh, you know, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We are engaging in spiritual warfare that ultimately will establish the glory of God, his name, and his purposes on the earth. So this is a this is a, a momentous event in the history of the church. This is an opportunity for God's people to stand up for what God has already declared in his word he is committed to. And we have that opportunity in our generation to do that through prayer, through support, uh, and through uh, no equivocation on this issue. It's a biblical issue, and we need to see it clearly. So one other question, and then I'll uh, ask for uh, prayer requests. Um, what are you all hearing from the ground from your from your people there um, in terms of what they're going through, what their needs are? Um, uh, what are you What are you hearing uh, from from Israel itself, David? Um, we have uh, about fifty staff of Jews for Jesus who are Israeli citizens on the ground in. Uh, primarily Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem. 
And uh, a, a number of our key staff have already been called up to the front lines to serve. Uh, some of them are, are in the north because we, we Israel needs to watch out for a two-front war, and it seems to be escalating there. But the majority are down in the south, mobilizing on uh, the border. Uh, there are already some of our staff who can't tell us where they are um, because there are secret missions that are going on to try to discover what is happening with the um, with the ter- with the uh, hostages, and uh, it's just a nightmare. But uh, a, a, a number of them are basically saying that the first group that's going to be called to go into Gaza are the 18 to 21 year olds. Mm. Uh, they they are in the middle of their their military service and they're the front line that's going in. And then the next uh, group will be those who've just completed their military service and and are are, are sharpest. But there are three hundred thousand reservists that are have been called up. And so a lot of these people are believers in Jesus, and a lot of these people are coming into this fight with uh, the hope of heaven. And so we want to pray and ask for prayer, especially for those of God's people who are on the front lines, who are defending uh, with their own lives the uh, these these uh, the, the, the Jewish people and Israel. And so uh, what our ministry is doing right now is trying to provide help for uh, these. We have uh, care packages that we're putting together at the Moish Rosen Center and distributing them to soldiers on the front line. We're also, uh, because so many uh, were who were attacked in the South are still living in bomb shelters, their homes were destroyed, we're providing meals, uh, personal needs, clothing, things like that for uh, those who are in need. Uh, We are also trying to provide ministry help uh, through distribution of the scriptures and then special events at the Moish Rosen Center. The children are traumatized. So, for example, just yesterday, we had an event for children at the Moish Rosen Center uh, where you could come and play with puppies. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so we had kids coming to have a relief from you know, the tension that they're feeling, but everybody feels it. And uh, there's a lot of trauma, Uh, emotional. Mitch mentioned the funerals. They're just constant on the news. Israel is a very small country. And so, you know, what we experienced here in America with 9-11, people are saying this is 9-11 times 10 when you consider the population of Israel. And so all of that trauma all of those needs are multiplied by the concentration of, uh, of the of the people. And so whether it be serving on the front line, bringing meals and care packages, uh, or just helping Israelis to cope, uh, we were we sent out in the first few days uh, 66 uh, New Testaments were requested through our um, our uh, website in Israel. And so there's a spiritual hunger as well as the needs of the people that are very much practical. We're trying to do our very best uh, to meet those needs. And of course, uh, our own staff, <laughs> I'm praying for them because this has a an impact on them just like it does everybody else in Israel. And it's hard to both care for yourself and, and care for the needs of those around you, but that's what needs to happen right now. And so those are the prayer needs and what's happening with our staff on the ground. Mitch, what's going on with chosen people? Well, very sim- very similar to what David uh, described. The needs are quite, quite obvious. Uh, th- there are needs, f- but because the soldiers, when you call up over 300,000 troops, it's not like you gathered the food before you call them up. You know, and so uh, there's uh, <laughs> there's been a great need for thermal underwear, you know, and it's not so easy to get as many pairs as you want. So the so the IDF did their best in getting people in, uh, but there's a lot of places where s- soldiers gather before they go down to their bases or their posts, and so we're meeting them there and trying to provide. Uh, one of the, we're, we're doing a lot of the same things that uh, David mentioned because those are the needs. Uh, one one little 
difference maybe uh, is uh, over the years, because we have a lot of Russian Jewish speakers on our staff, uh, because of that, we've had a really intensive ministry among Holocaust survivors. And a lot of these Holocaust survivors, um, they were children. And, uh, and some of them were at the most teenagers. And when I started with, with Chosen People 26 years ago and became a direct uh, president, uh, we, there were probably over 300, 350,000 Holocaust survivors. And we had ministries all over the country uh, to the Holocaust survivors, loving them, taking them on trips, taking them overseas, taking them on tours, cleaning their homes, helping them. Uh, feeding them. I mean, you know, just everything. And it took 10 years before we actually saw any of them come to faith. But now we've seen quite a few uh, come to the Lord. Uh, but now the numbers reduced. Maybe nobody really knows, but maybe less than 50,000 of these elderly Holocaust survivors. So we had a uh, we had a very strong ministry in Sederot, uh, it's the way you'll you'll hear it either way. But uh, and so Center Road is in the process at this very moment of being totally evacuated. They say that only about 10 percent of the, I don't know, 40 or 50,000 people that live there on a regular basis, of whom many, many are elderly Holocaust survivors, will be out. And uh, and as David says, they're going to need a place to stay and they're going to need food. Chosen Peoples had a long-term relationship with many of these families. And so we are, we're cooking, you know, and we're distributing food and praying with people and, as usual, sharing the gospel. But we also had a relationship, not just with the towns on bordering Gaza, but some other towns. There was one kibbutz um, that was um, in the south, and there's a town that was near that kibbutz, called Ofakim, O-F-A-K-I-M, town of about 35,000 people. About a third of them were Orthodox, or ultra-Orthodox Jews, about a third were Holocaust survivors, and Russian speakers, and then the rest. Well, uh, we were ministering there uh, for years, uh, doing holiday celebrations, Hanukkah, Passover, and they were very, very involved uh, with us. And uh, what we found out, on the Sunday, on, on the 8th, was that uh, a group of the terrorists entered Ofakim and slaughtered a whole bunch of people. But five of the people that we were ministering to on an absolute regular basis were gruesomely killed. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were in, if they were in their late 80s, they were young. They were in their 90s. And one of the one of the men uh, was taken as a hostage. We think we don't know because they can't find his body, but uh, he's in his early nineties. And so we have a group of traumatized elderly people, and so we have done everything we can to, to help these people who we love and we know well. So what we just did was we, we took about thirty or forty of them to the Dead Sea. We, they needed to get out. And we had a, a, a retreat. Most of those who came were unbelievers. But we went to the Dead Sea and we gave them some time to relax. And the conversations uh, were very intense. As you know, th- you think about it, they, 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 got, they escaped the Holocaust. Admittedly, very young, but they escaped the Holocaust. Then they were pretty much imprisoned as Jews in the former Soviet Union. They couldn't really identify. Then in, during Perestroika, they left, and they ended up living in Israel, which was a dream of so many of theirs. They, they wanted to get out and to live as Jews. And now they died as Jews in the most horrible way. Well, of course, they died, but the people who are still alive are devastated. I mean, beyond devastation. And so the amount of post-traumatic stress and trauma counseling that we're doing, it's, I mean, it's just going on all day and all night. Hmm. And uh, so that's one, uh, there's a lot going on among younger adults. We have a lot of young adults that we're ministering to. 
But this is a particular uh, group of people that we've had a unique ministry to for years. And, and that's just the, the beginning of it all, Daryl. Um, we, you know, uh, we learned a lot. I'm sure David learned a lot. A lot of us in ministry learned a lot. Uh, in New York, we had 9-11, then we had Hurricane Sandy, and then we had a pandemic, and, you know, now, now, then we had Ukra Ukraine and, and Russia, a war where, where I know Jews for Jesus was very involved there, still is, and so are we. And now we have this horrible thing happen. It's probably almost really the most horrible thing that, that happened. And, you know, it's, it, it's not that we are battle-hardened. Uh, when it comes to disaster, but you know, we do have some experience, unfortunately, now. Mm. And we know that there are at least three phases. And we're in the first phase right now, barely into the first phase. And that's the emergency phase. So right now, we're throwing every piece of spaghetti against the wall, doing everything we can to try and meet people's needs physically and spiritually, emotionally and psychologically no matter who they are, what age they are. Uh, I mean, think you have 300,000 call-ups. Well, most of them, or many of them, not most of them, but many of them are, are married. Many of them have kids. And most of them are men because um, there'll be some women, but most of them are going to be men. And so we have a, a whole ministry that we've been, we've been doing to these poor moms uh, and, and wives that are at home and they don't know if they'll ever see their husbands again or their fathers. And so we are ministering to them. Of course, they need meals and they need other things, but most of all, they need someone to hold their hand, to pray with them, to talk with them. And so our staff is just, you know, dozens of staff in Israel. They're just going all day and all night uh, doing this kind of thing. And so we we need the prayers of believers and i i really appreciate the 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 support and the and the giving that christians have i mean most of us were getting gifts we we never solicited i mean god was i mean money was just coming in david i'm sure that was true for you too and it was just coming and boy i wish i mean and the money's important we appreciate it we're grateful and i wish that some of what we're doing could be solved by money, hmm. but it can't. Hmm. You can't. And so this is, we, we're grateful for the investment. And uh, of course, we need the funding because there's stuff, a lot of stuff we have to buy for people. Hmm. And we have to rent spaces because there's not enough space for them to stay in different places. But it's, it really pray for our staff and pray for JFJ staff, Jews for Jesus staff. Because it's 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 you can only imagine what the because our staff were all Israelis too. You can only imagine what they're going through, and now they need to give out. Yeah. I so mean, let me let me ask so you. It's, it's really tough. Let me let me ask you this question. Um, so the population of Israel is what? I actually don't know. So I'm, it's an honest question. <laughs> A little over seven million seven. Point three seven million, million Jews. Jews yeah. Okay, so um, another two million, another two million uh, who are Arabs. Okay, so there are nine at million at least. So nine million people in the area. Um, yeah, and on the Israeli side, seven million Jews. Um, Three hundred thousand reservists. How many people are in the core army? Are we talking about? Do you know? That's a good question. Know. You know what? I don't know. So I don't the, think they give that. I don't think they give that information out, Daryl. Okay, well that's interesting because sure, sure, so, sure, someone knows. So here's here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to say that probably one out of every what twenty thirty people has been called up uh, in the country, and uh, um, and that doesn't count the people who are already in the army. So so my point is, um, everybody. Everybody is very, very closely connected to what's happening in the land. Daryl, I just, I just Googled it. 169,500 active troops in the IDF. Okay. So, 350, so that's 500,000, right, when you put the two numbers together. So that's 1 in 14. Have I got that right? Would that be right? 1 in 14 oh, pretty, people are directly involved? Good. 
Well, you write commentaries on Acts and Luke, and you, and you can also add, Daryl. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I didn't you know? do that on a calculator. That's just off the top of my head. May or may not be right. I can't always trust the way I handle numbers. But anyway, my wife will tell you I definitely can't do that. So it anyway, sounds, it sounds it sounds pretty close. You know, we have we have a saying. You know, the six degrees of separation uh-huh. among believers. Among believers, that drops to four or five. Yeah. Among Jews, it it it's about one or two. Yeah. Okay. And. And and that's the hard part. It's not just Jews Jews in Israel who know people, right? Who are in the army or who have died uh, as a result of all this. We all do. We all every, every single one of us yeah. uh, do. And and that's 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 the difficulty. You know where where Jew, Jews suffer as a community. You know. Yep. Well, I just I just wanted to have people have kind of you know because you brought up nine eleven earlier and um, the the proximity issue in Israel is far more intense than than anything that happened here. That's that's part of what I want people to realize. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. So, well, I want to thank you all for taking the time to um, kind of update us on what's going on and to think about what we should pray for. You certainly gave us a nice list of things to to take into consideration and to give us the background of what's going on. We do pray for the ministries that are represented, not just from Jews for Jesus and Chosen People, but for anyone who's ministering in the area. And uh, and we'll just um, um, we'll just I imagine I might be calling you back in the future to see where things are in terms of what's going on so we can keep people informed. But I really do appreciate you giving us the time. Uh, Let me close us in a word of prayer. Father, we do um, just lay this situation before you. And if there ever was a time where people feel like they're at a loss uh, because of the depth of pain and the depth of evil and the depth of, of the challenge of what it means to live in a fallen and broken world, it's now. And we just ask for your protection for those uh, who are trying to um, save lives and to um, and, and trying to protect people. Uh, we pray for wisdom for those who are making decisions about what is going to happen and what is happening. Uh, we pray for um, some way to break through um, what is uh, this deep level of sustained. Um, hate and evil, and uh, that we pray that that at least something uh, good and redeeming can come out of it. But we do ask for your uh, for your leading and guidance of those who are on staff of these ministries, and for the ministry of outreach that they're providing. May it provide some measure of of a uh, communication of care and love to those uh, who are being ministered to. And we just um, ask for your. Guidance, we, there's probably no situation more like this when we realize that we need uh, what you are able to provide for us. So we pray for that. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for the opportunity, Daryl. You're very, very welcome. Thank you, David, as well, for uh, giving us your time. Privilege. And we thank you for being a part of the table, and we hope you'll join us again soon for listening to The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.